Welcome to Connecticut eHealth Podcast, educating, conversing, and connecting for better health. The Connecticut eHealth Podcast is a space where we get together with local and national experts, key stakeholders, and other individuals in the space of eHealth to discuss health information in Connecticut and around the country. This podcast is brought to you from the Yukon Health Interoperability, Innovation, and Learning Lab, where our mission is to promote the optimal adoption and use of eHealth by providing education and engaging in conversation with leaders to create connections for better health. So let's sit back and get connected. Well, it's Tom Agresta. I'm a family physician and clinical informaticist at the University of Connecticut Medical School. I'll be your host for this episode of the Connecticut eHealth Podcast. Today's guest is Dr. Rochelle DeMaio, the Chief Medical Information Officer at Connecticut Children's. Her background includes a bachelor's from Dartmouth College and her MD degree from McGill University Faculty of Medicine. She completed her residencies at Brown University Hasbro Children's Hospital and the Children's Hospital Philadelphia. She went on to complete a fellowship training at Johns Hopkins University in health services research and an additional one at Cornell Wheel Medical College in clinical informatics and quality care. She's board certified in pediatrics and clinical informatics and has been at her role at Connecticut Children's since 2011. And it's been my pleasure, actually, I've known Rochelle now probably roughly since about 2011 or maybe a little bit after that. And it's a real pleasure to have you join us today, uh, Rochelle. Thanks. It's a pleasure to be here. And, you know, even though we've known each other for a long time, that doesn't mean we're old, right, Tom? We're still young and spry. That's absolutely. We grow younger by the day. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we'll be talking actually about, about uh, children and children's, uh, children's needs in healthcare and healthcare data exchange. So, so it's a great uh, honor to have you here. And I'd like to actually tell us, have you tell us a little bit about uh, about yourself and how you ended up in your current role as the as the CMIO or Chief Medical Informatics Officer at Connecticut Children's. Well, I can say um, <laughs> I would describe it as an organic process. Uh, it was I took a kind of meandering route. So after medical school, I started uh, a pediatrics residency, uh, and then I kind of detoured and interrupted for some graduate work and uh, a fellowship in health services research. And then I returned to clinical medicine because I, I missed patients. But I've just always been very interested in health literacy and systems navigation, population health, and kind of, I guess, systems-based quality improvement. And that led me back to informatics. So I, I went and pursued some postgraduate studies at both Columbia and Cornell. And that was around the time when our medical center began implementing its enterprise you know, electronic health records spurred you know, by high tech and era funding. And so I was asked to participate and I said, okay, I'll do it on an interim basis. And the interim basis is now 11 years later. <laughs> so I don't know. That's the, that's the way I came to the role. I hope you're still not named interim. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> At some point they wooed me into the permanent position. That's great. So can you describe for our audience, the folks that may not know a little bit about children's medical CCMC and it's affiliated practices that's very, very different than when it first formed. But, you know, where is it today? And tell yeah. us a little bit about it. All right. Well, so the very first thing I'll say is, yes, it has it has grown. It is now officially no longer a pediatric entity itself. I mean, it has it's now an adult, but but we don't call ourselves CCMC anymore. We call ourselves Connecticut Children's. We were actually initially founded, you know, before the turn of the century, like 1898, I think. And they had kind of a quaint name. It was the the Newington Home for Incurables. And then, I don't know, some years later, I think maybe the late 80s, um, Newington Children's and Hartford Healthcare and the UConn Pediatric Residency all joined forces and, and came to our current campus in Hartford. But we've really kind of continued to grow since that time. So we now have ambulatory sites throughout Connecticut uh, in Fairfield County and, and Massachusetts. And we've got inpatient units in Hartford, Farmington, and Waterbury. And we provide pro pediatric professional services throughout Connecticut and New York, actually, through arrangements with New Vance and Hartford Healthcare and Bay State. We've got some urgent care. I would say from a health information exchange perspective, maybe some of the most relevant or significant milestones were, I don't know if it was exactly maybe two, 2018, 2019, we uh, participated in the establishment of a clinical care network that now includes 36 community-based pediatric practices that use more than 
12 different electronic medical record systems platforms. And then in 2020, at around the time of the pandemic, we formed a pediatric alliance with an adult system, Hartford Healthcare, to kind of provide for better care coordination. And this year, uh, we're bringing live a behavioral health unit, which obviously brings uh, different challenges and different opportunities from a health information exchange perspective. That sounds like it's kept you quite busy, Rochelle. <laughs> <laughs> it really has. I mean, you can't you can't like rest on your laurels here. This this institution is constantly re-engineering itself. Yeah, and, and it's a very similar you know story to many others we've talked to. It's just constantly um, you know in in change and growth mode and. And as as uh, just like that, technology is constantly in change and growth modes. Can you talk a little bit about you know the types of technologies that you're using to kind of um, share data across all these different organizations that are kind of connected in these in in you know by its sort of nature, caring for patients who are younger than eighteen, pediatric patients. Yeah. So I think we obviously even within our own organization, I think I mentioned to you, we have inpatient facilities that are all using different instances. They happen to be using the same EHR, but they're using different instances of that EHR. So we leveraged a whole range of technologies to kind of move information to where it needs to be. So we use direct messages, we use HL7, we use fire, we, we also even use fax. I mean, you know, it's sad to say, but we still, we still use fax. You know, in terms of the kinds of health information exchange, we don't own our own lab, so we send orders to the lab via, you know, direct exchange. We used query-based exchanges to, to ask for information when patients present to our, you know, our clinics or the, the ER. And we allow, uh, through, through the patient portal, we allow uh, patients to kind of, you know, gather all of their information together and link their patient portal experiences. So I guess, I don't know, in some ways, kind of like a a patient facilitated you know health information exchange yeah that's it, it sounds like a uh, quite a like spider web of connections that you've got going on there yeah but so important like you know and it, it's both a blessing and a curse right because there's a lot of information there not always organized and presented in ways that are easily digestible but you know we've really now come to rely on having access to information in, in a timely fashion, you know, gone are the days where you would kind of submit a request to the HIM department and expect to, you know, have paper documents arrive at your door. Well, and thank God for that. I can say that I, I care for some, you know, some patients in our, my own clinical setting as a family physician where they go into the emergency room at CCMC and, and the next morning I have, you know, kind of a summary of their care. And like you said, it's not always organized in a way that makes complete sense, but it is far, far better than it used to be. And, and as you kind of face some challenges, some of these data challenges as CMIO, what are the things that are kind of unique maybe with a children's hospital and, a, and caring for pediatric patients? Surprisingly, um, well, maybe not surprisingly to you. I think you're probably well aware, Tom, but there are lots of unique aspects of health information exchange that are really kind of grounded in the pediatric experience. So the very first thing is, you know, patient matching and patient identity. You know, newborns are frequently born without the parents having decided on a name. <laughs> and <laughs> there is no, unfortunately, no national standard, no naming convention for how we name newborns. And then they, that's like their temporary name, and then they get a permanent name. So that is a unique challenge in pediatrics, you know, just moving information around for, um, for babies in the NICU, especially, you know, multiple babies, like big babies of a multiple gestation is, is a challenge. I would say, Privacy is one of the hugest concerns from my perspective. Our charts frequently will contain information about the parent because it's relevant to the medical decision making for the child. But sometimes we have parents who have adopted a child and have not yet disclosed to the child that the child is adopted. Mm -hmm. Or we have a, you know, a sexually active adolescent who has not shared that information with one or both of the parents uh, or the guardians. So sequestering and compartmentalizing information is a, a real challenge. I think, I mean, it's a challenge for health information exchange all over the place, but it's a particular challenge across the lifespan and, and for pediatric patients. I would say um, social determinants of health, which is a challenge for adults too, but, you know, pediatric care is so grounded in that family context. And so we're interested in information about the patient, the child, but also about 
the guardians and there there's not only one there's usually multiple guardians and so getting and and documenting accurate information and then also protecting that information in the in the most responsible way and making sure that people who shouldn't be seeing certain information aren't is is sometimes a challenge yeah, I know that we've kind of run across some similar challenges in caring for some of our pediatric patients that you're describing. And so I, they really resonate with me. I, you know, foster parents is another place where I see their tremendous, you know, challenges. And then, you know, where there's paternity issues or other kinds of, you know, very sensitive information that, you know, are relevant to a child's health, but may not be easy to expose to, to the other parent are, are certainly things that we've seen in our own practice that challenges. Well, and I think, yeah, totally. I mean, and I would say even beyond that, you know, we're interested, we, when we think about social determinants of health, for instance, we're interested in depression in the patient, but we're also interested in depression in the parent. And so we have to be very mindful of making sure it's unambiguous whose information is being uh, reported where. So that's another, you know, another challenge I would say. Yeah, but I think things are getting better, but I don't think we've solved all of those problems. No, by by no means. And I and I agree with you. Those are all those are all real things that, that we haven't figured out exactly how to have a, a paired parental uh, child chart, for example, where where that one might be helpful. You know, but I think I do think we're headed in that direction. I you know, I think one of the other things that I think is particularly challenging is that uh, when we talk about pediatric patients. They're growing rapidly and changing rapidly, and especially complex patients. You, you um, uh, mentioned in our warm up that you recently helped bring live a NICU at John Dempsey Hospital. And those are, those are infants that are changing rapidly and sometimes require complex medication regimens, complex drips that are weight based or body surface area based. And, yep. and I don't know that people understand the complexity of how that data changes almost from week to week and the meaning of that data can change from week to week. So maybe you can talk a little bit about how you deal with that and how you communicate with your team members and even your informatics staff around things like that. Well, I don't know that that it has changed our practice. When we record information, obviously there's a whole bunch of metadata that, you know, tags that information as having taken place at a certain time. We have had to create certain additional tables so that we can not only present an absolute value, like an absolute BMI, but a, a relative percentile based upon age or you know sex. Uh, and that's not always available beyond a pediatric health system. Um, you know, a similar example, I think, would be like, you know, morphine milligram equivalents. You know, we're all always interested in doses, but doses for pediatrics, as you pointed out, are often weight-based or body surface area based. And so you really need to have the context for that. I think we're very accustomed to doing that, but when we pull information in from other you know, organizations, you know, we have to be mindful of when it, when it occurred. I would say another, you know, another challenge, frankly, is, is vaccines. Um, making sure that we have the right mapping to recognize the different um, you know, kind of multiple vaccine preparations, but then also implementing logic so that the most accurate, most recent data is what overrides anything that might have preceded it, you know, and not in the, not in the reverse kind of thing. So that's been a challenge as well. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting because, you know, obviously the way we record vaccines, I mean, there are now vaccines that, um, you know, have four and five components to them. And, yeah. and, you know, when you and I got vaccinated, we got like, you know, three vaccines and they only had one component in them. Right. You know, but now there's four and five and they change formulations and not all systems are Rated equal, and they may be stored in an old uh, on an old paper chart and then pulled in, and so it, it is a challenge. I agree, and and um, my guess is that you are uh, finding data exchange through the immunization registry to have both pluses and and minuses associated with it. I'm guessing, right? Yeah, I think absolutely. I mean, there there are just very few children whose record is maintained exclusively within the walls of one institution. I mean, people move, things happen. Uh, the, you know, the whole global pandemic has resulted in people getting vaccinated increasingly at pharmacies, you know, which they didn't used to do. And so aggregating that information and making sense of it into a coherent whole is really important. So we do need to rely on the, the statewide information uh, exchange for, for immunizations, in addition to, you know, developing kind of decision support within our own system so that when that information comes in, we can make sense of it. 
Yeah, no, predicting when the next vaccine is due or what's missing is, is always a, a valuable thing, and, but it's only as good as the, the discrete data that's available to you as well. So, you know, walk us through a little bit of what typically happens, you know, for a patient who might be, you, 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 um, you said that you have a practice where you're clinically seeing patients as well. And I, and I heard from your, your statements prior to our getting on the podcast that you're really kind of doing a, a specialized, you know, healthcare with regards to headache medicine. Walk us through like what happens with your um, typical exchange with a primary care clinician who might make a referral to you and how you're exchanging data now um, back and forth with them, even if they're outside your, your system. Like, you know, if they're in, for example, if I was to refer a patient with, to you. Yeah. So I think we leverage a variety of different resources because there's no one perfect way of getting information. Uh, so we're very fortunate. We are, you know, fully connected with Connie. We're also connected with CT HealthLink, which is another HIE within the state. All EPIC, where we use EPIC at Connecticut Children's, and all EPIC using organizations have the ability to exchange information with each other via, you know, a, a module in, in the system known as Care Everywhere. And we also participate in care quality. So we leverage everything that we can to try and make sense of why this patient has come to us and what they need from us and what what labs have been drawn, what imaging has been conducted, you know, there are often still gaps, to be honest with you. And, you know, a CCD, uh, you know, the, the CCD architecture, I think, you know, is a huge advance from, from where we used to be, but it doesn't contain all of the things that are relevant to the way that we provide care, right? And, <laughs> and it's stripped often of some of that really important metadata. So, if the child is on oral contraceptives, who knows about that? I don't know who knows about that from, from the health information exchange. So, um, you know, some of those things are can be a little tricky. Yeah, no, I, I, they certainly can. And, and I'm laughing because, of course, the, uh, the CCD, even when it contains everything, can be a challenge to read because of its structure. We do, we do have a ways to go, but it is certainly much, much better, you know, than it, than it used to be for sure. So... If you were to sort of kind of imagine forward, you know, you're, you're connected to the state's health information exchange, you're connected to other things, you know, imagine more ideal state, kind of walk me through what a more ideal state for data exchange would be like for you. Well, so I, I just want to point out that we've configured our system to execute these queries automatically for scheduled patients. And when patients show up in the emergency department, we also execute an automatic query. If someone shows up in the emergency department and says, you know, I just got back from a vacation in Florida, I sought care in Florida, we have the ability to supplement that with manual queries. Uh, and I think that's really important. But I think you want to make this as painless as possible for the clinical team so that it happens behind the scenes and the information is there for them to find when they need it. Um, so that would be one thing that I would say. And I'm not sure, I mean, maybe, I mean, hopefully this is true of most other organizations within the state, but I hope everybody else is executing automated queries too. <laughs> Because, you know, otherwise you're just adding an extra burden to the, to the clinician. And then I think it would, be, it would be very nice. Like, you know, in my ideal world, I would like to be able to, to more appropriately sequester information. That's not possible right now all, always. So we pull all of the information and then we have to use good judgment to disclose certain things and, you know, kind of discreetly ask about whether other things can be disclosed. So there's still an element of judgment in there as well. I say I would say that some of the things that you know would be really helpful is if our emergency medical services had access to some of this information. You know that would be huge. I think for them, I I would love to also see kind of cross sector utilization of health information exchanges. You know within the bounds obviously of privacy and and protected health information. But when we think of our especially in pediatrics our school systems, you know they're they're often delivering or accessing or you know needing to refer to care plans and, and the such and uh, social services organizations similarly. So I would love to see kind of an appropriately porous boundary between health, you know, defined narrowly, and those who are involved in promoting and, and supporting health broadly. Right, and with good access control and consent and things like that, I'm sure I I, I know you well enough to know those are all you know part of it. You know, well, you mentioned kind of the schools having access to information, and one of the most common things that I think schools could really benefit from having access to is, you know, data that might be changing. You know, they get their school form filled out every couple of years at certain ages, and 
and some of the things change, you know, I mean, the medicines they're on, the, you know, you know, clinical diagnoses they may have, a child may have, you know, um, a great example is, you know, asthma control is very different now than it used to be a few years ago, and the medicines that people will, will utilize and, and their sort of rescue plans are different. Yeah. So the ability to share back and forth, you know, for things that happen pretty commonly in, in a, um, in a school setting, you know, uh, might be very good, huh? Yeah, I would say the same thing for like, you know, food allergies, for, you know, epilepsy. There are lots of kind of care plans that are very relevant to school personnel and may change not only, you know, over years, but within a year, you know, as as the clinical condition changes. So it would be nice to be able to really easily share that information. I can't tell you how many medication authorization forms I fill out at this time of year, you know, as people are. (laughs) So having accurate information into what the child is, has been prescribed and, you know, is supposed to be taking would also be a huge win in my, in my books. The old medical medication reconciliation problem. (laughs) Yeah. Your favorite. I know. (laughs) All right. Connecticut Children's is connected to Connie, which is our state health information exchange. Can you tell me how it's utilized at, uh, at Connecticut Children's? Are you, are you using the in-context app and Describe that for folks if you are, or how how are you utilizing it? So it shows up where all of our other health information exchange does. So as I mentioned before, Epic has this application called Care Everywhere. And if we go to that part of the chart, we'll see information that comes in from any entity in that. And you know, Connie would be included there. So I, I happened actually just before we got on together today just to look at our incoming results for the past week. So this isn't the information we're sharing beyond our walls, but the information we're ingesting. And, you know, there were 10,000 things coming in from Connie, 10,000 of of 20,000. So it was like half of our data coming in. So it's a lot. You know, is it always complete? No, it's not always complete. It might just be a CCD, (laughs) but but it's something, you know, so there's something to build on there. Right. Well, let's take a moment and actually do a little bit of... uh listening to our sponsor, Connie, and learn a little bit more about them. We want to take this opportunity to thank Connie, Connecticut's official health information exchange. Connie was established in 2019 to oversee and provide services to support the exchange of health data in the state of Connecticut. Connie is an independent and not-for-profit organization. To learn more about Connie, please visit ConnieCT.org or go to the show notes from today's episode. All right. Well, as you come back uh, and kind of pick up the conversation, you you mentioned a lot of different things that you're kind of sharing, and that and the tremendous amount of you know volume of messages coming in. Can you tell us a little bit about what features, what use cases you would really like to see a health information exchange kind of carry out for you? You you kind of mentioned social determinants. You mentioned some other stuff, but walk us through what it would mean. What would be the use case for that? So. I will say to you that um, one of the most fundamental things, and I know you and I have talked about this in the past, I'm not sure where Connie actually is in this, but we've talked about the importance of having an accurate provider directory because providers move around too, and that information can change. Right now, we, we rely on some of our kind of service providers to send us that information, and then we also supplement it with our own curation, and that is extremely time-consuming and, <laughs> and, um, and very labor-intensive for a single organization, and ideally, that would actually be managed by some centralized process. So everybody could use the, the same service, right? Yeah. <laughs> and so that would be really helpful. I think, you know, the one, the, the gaps that I really see often in my own patient population are uh, kind of community-based therapists like psychologists or or licensed clinical social workers. Somehow those aren't those aren't populated in our system as readily as I would like them to be. And so we're constantly like I'm doing Google searches to figure out how to get in touch with this. Mm. So that would be nice. I would say the ability to um, to format a care plan and share a care plan, not only with other members of the healthcare team, but also as I mentioned before, with those kind of cross-sector or you know intersector use cases with like a school nurse or with uh, you know, a social services agency would be, would be ideal if the patient family had the ability to determine whether it should be shared or not. You know, it, it, that may change what, whom they feel comfortable with seeing what, and I would love for them to be able to do that, but to have control over it. And it would be you know, maybe a little bit aspirational at this point, because I don't know that we have all the levers that we need. Birth to Three is another perfect example of those social services agencies that would really benefit from having access to this information. 
right now, I, as, as, you, as we speak, I think one of the good things that I can tell you is that the provider directory is, is on the, you know, it's being worked on and, and rolled out and being maintained, I think, in a central way is actually the aspiration and the goal. And so I, at least I can kind of tell you is on the, on the roadmap for that. The ability to communicate care plans and social determinants of health is actually also on the roadmap. Excellent. Um, and so there are some things that uh, you know, are, are there. I think your um, ideas about finding a way to give collaborative control you know, to patients and their families, and I kind of say collaborative to the patients and their families, because I know that a 15-year-old may and may not want their parents to have access to some pieces of data. Yeah. Um, and not all 15-year-olds are the same. Some of them have, you know, are special needs patients and, and their families need access to the data because they have to have it manage a very, very complex set of care. So it's a, it is a very, very, you know, unique to each individual patient kind of issue. Yeah, I would, I would agree. I think the other things that, that I use a lot, I'm not sure that everybody else has access to is we have a medication dispense report that shows us what was actually, you know, dispensed from a pharmacy over the past six months. That can be extraordinarily helpful. <laughs> it would be nice to see that available through the HIE. We're right now working on a project to um, kind of match those maternal child dyads or, you know, in the case of multiple gestation, maternal uh, child groupings, because we need that information from a pediatric perspective and obstetricians need that information as well to know about the outcomes, the quality outcomes of their care. So that can be challenging because of the patient identification matching, matching issues, but it would be fantastic if there were, you know, a database of that kind of linked information for us to, to access. Mm, interesting. I mean, it's, it's often done inside a given organization when the child is just born, like, you know, and then they're named, you know, female Smith, <laughs> you know, the mother's last name. Yeah, you're absolutely right. If they're born in the institution where the child gets care. Exactly. <laughs> we don't have that situation <laughs> because we don't do, um, you know, maternal fetal medicine or labor and delivery. And we also serve, you know, as the, the organization that, um, that manages the, new, the statewide newborn screening program. So there are newborns throughout the, or, you know, the, the state where they, the mother was never our patient, that she's not in our enterprise medical record system. But, you know, being able to find her would be helpful. Yeah, you actually bring up an actu actually a different kind of uh, topic that um, is going to grow in importance and that, you know, you do the newborn screenings um, and it would probably be helpful if you describe for our listeners what, you know, what it means to get a newborn screening, because I'm not sure everyone knows okay. what kind of data is actually there and what is coming down in the future that might be a little different than have a little bit of different flair in terms of genomics and other things like that. Well, don't get me started on genomics because I feel like that could be its whole, you know, a whole discussion that we spend an hour on, you know, just that. But the way that the statewide newborn screening program works is that shortly after delivery, you know, there's this kind of heel stick that's done on most newborns, maybe not on, on extremely fragile premature newborns, but most newborns. And that little blood sample is sent to the state lab where it is assayed for a variety of metabolic conditions, you know, hematologic conditions that might not get detected quickly enough if we just waited for clinical symptoms to present. You know, we want to get ahead of that so that we can intervene appropriately. All of the abnormal screens throughout the state of Connecticut are sent to us, and we make outreach to those families and ensure that, you know, there's appropriate follow-up for those families, either within the walls of Connecticut Children's or in other healthcare organizations within the state. So part of the newborn screen in this state includes cystic fibrosis screening. That's not part of the blood sample, you know, the heel spot test. It's a different test and that's conducted separately. But I'm speaking more about the, the blood samples. But you're right, with genomics data and with the ability, I think, to incre increasingly to do kind of genomics surveillance, we don't right now have great standards or pipelines to exchange all of that information and to make it actionable within the receiving organization. So a lot of opportunity there, but I don't think anybody's really sorted out the right way to get it done. Yeah, no, I think that there is a, a long-term need to figure out how to keep that data because that data is relevant, perhaps not until you're 50, you know, or so until you're much later in life, you know, but perhaps much earlier too as well, or even 
it's it's relevant to the parents, even though the child is the one having the lab work done or a sibling or whatever, right? Or, you know, we don't realize that it's relevant now, but, you know, in five years from now, you know, a uh, variant of uncertain significance now becomes a variant of known significance. So, yeah, you're absolutely correct. There's a time horizon aspect to it that I think makes it even more tricky. Yeah. And, 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 and I know that I think there's more genomic testing going on on children who are ill than certainly in adults that are ill. So it's actually, you know, something that's happening more frequently in, in children's hospitals, I believe. I, I don't think so, actually. I would, no? I would, no, I think, you know, especially within like kind of oncology with like breast cancer genomics and other things like that, colon cancer, I think you're having actually a lot more done, uh, and certainly in, in terms of pharmacogenomics in the adult population, but it's increasingly becoming so important in pediatrics as well. I mean, I think we're, we're you know, indisputably in the age of precision medicine, and it's only going to continue to increase. Right. Yeah, I mean, you're right. The, the testing of particular cancers is definitely done quite regularly at this point to try to determine yeah. the best therapy for it. And it really has changed the therapy of cancer. Mm -hmm. So I only say that because it's sometimes difficult to get the insurer to pay for the genomics testing of children. <laughs> <laughs> that, that would well, be <laughs> well, actually, you bring up an interesting, you know, an interesting topic. There was a, a use case that was originally set up for the HIE, and I'm, I'm not sure where it will go and what will happen with it, but one of the original use cases uh, suggested and explored a little bit was around prior authorization, you know, and actually having the HIE act as a, a conduit or, you know, participate in some fashion with, uh, you know, reducing the, the burden on prior authorization for, for procedures and testing and maybe medications, et cetera. Look, if you can come up with a solution to that, I will I will forever be your fan. <laughs> we are embarking upon a local solution uh, within our walls this coming year just because it has become so problematic. And I can say that especially as someone who frequently uses off-label treatments that are FDA approved in adults, but we use them in children and we have to go through a very cumbersome prior authorization process to get our patients access to that information. It is incredibly time consuming. It is not closed loop in a in any way, shape, or form. Um, and you know, that would be lovely if we had some sort of centralized, you know, kind of clearinghouse for that. I'm sure. Uh, you mentioned a little earlier around um, you know, medicate reconciling medications and and um, utilizing the, you know, kind of the the filled meds, you know, medication history. Yeah. I don't know if you if you realize it, but you know, a, a dream of, of yours and mine, and, and for the audience to know, one of the things that Rochelle and I did a while back was kind of collaborate on trying to figure out if we can get medication reconciliation, you know, kind of fixed at the state level. And, and she prompted me to, 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 to take on a task that has run several years <laughs> by pulling people together. But we've just launched a best possible medication history within the HIE. So there actually is a tab now called BPMH. Or best possible medication history. It's not perfect, but it but it uses the CCDA data and it compiles and does some deduplication, et cetera. That sounds awesome. I think that we probably have a ways to go within our organization in truly leveraging all of the functionality available through Connie because we're not accessing all of its functionality directly. We're accessing it through Care Everywhere. So. I don't see that report. I guess I'll have to work and make sure that we have a way of presenting that information to our users because that would be very valuable. That alone may 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 have you launch the in context app. <laughs> so so yes, maybe maybe by the virtue of this podcast, you 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 learn something that will make your the life of yourself and your other clinicians a little bit easier. Yeah, I think I think I have. <laughs> So um, this has been a wonderful conversation. Can you kind of share with us a little bit of words of wisdom, the things you'd like to, to share with other pediatricians maybe in the state, other clinicians about where you'd like things to go, about you know, where you've seen things go? You know, the, the, it's been a journey. Well, so I think, I don't know if I have words of wisdom, but what I would say is from my perspective, there is both the continuing technical evolution, which allows us to share things that we weren't previously able to, you know, images being, being an example or, or genomics in a structured way, not just like a PDF coming back in. Um, so that is exciting. And I think people need to remember to stay engaged and abreast of, of change because things are changing fairly quickly in this area. This is not the kind of area where you can check in every five years and, and nothing's different. 
Um, this is an evolving area. But then I would say each organization needs to spend a lot of time thinking about the usability of, of these workflows. It's not mm -hmm. just enough to build it and they will come. You have to think about how a busy clinician in the middle of a, a day seeing lots of patients is actually going to access and integrate, assimilate this information into their medical decision making. And that actually requires, you know, rolling up your sleeves and, and looking at the screens and watching what they do and how are they, how are they seeing this information? So I would just encourage attention to that as well. Yeah, no, that's, that's a very, very key, uh, you know, set of advice. And, and it's, uh, you know, part of what makes a clinical informatician, a clinical informatician, because they, they generally have to actually do the things that they are asking others to do. And they, <laughs> therefore, <laughs> they understand a little bit about the pain of, you know, adopting a new technology and, and some things come real easy and some things don't, right? Yeah. Well, and I think, you know, ideally the system is so self-explanatory, you don't need training on it, right? But there are some things where there might be an easier, faster, more efficient way of getting the information. And, you know, we should be educating our colleagues and helping them to make the best use of this information possible. You know, it was horrible when we had no information. But it would be worse if we're drowning in a sea of information and can't make sense of it in order to improve care. So we need to think about both things. Yeah, we absolutely do. Because you could be drowning in a sea of information, can't make heads or tails of it, and still be responsible for knowing it all, right? <laughs> yes, isn't that true? <laughs> <laughs> well, this has been a, um, a real delight, Rochelle. I, I really uh, appreciate spending the time uh, with us and kind of sharing your words of wisdom. and. And uh, I really look forward to seeing where you uh, help bring Connecticut Children's forward in the ways that you've been doing so far. Well, thanks so much. And really, Tom, I, I am so appreciative of your kind of like years of engagement on this topic. I mean, you've really worked tirelessly to advance <laughs> health information exchange in the state. So, um, you know, we really are appreciative. All right. Well, excellent. As always, wishing you the best of health. Your host, Tom Agresta. 